everybody agrees. So we have an agenda for today, everyone. Uh, just summary. I think today's meeting is particularly special. I think we'll try to have a, um, a purpose for the, our meetings. Today's meetings is we're calling it advocating for CPS students. Mm -hmm. And and <clears throat> sorry. So I want to just give a brief summary of the purpose for why we put this together, why we invited SEPTA, why Eve is here, for instance. Um, and, and, and then we do introductions. And one of the goals of this meeting, I'm hoping, is that maybe RMF, along with Eve, along with SEPTA, is maybe we can come up with some tentative action plans for the summer. I know the, school's, the school is almost over, so just, just a working plan of what we can do. Um, and so <clears throat> let's get started. Tracy, do you want to maybe start off of briefly three minutes on why are we calling this meeting with SEPTA and advocating for CPS students? Yes, so we're calling this <coughs> meeting tonight um, in response to um, a complaint that Candace Barnes filed, um, a human rights complaint about the way her daughter was treated by Columbia Public Schools. And basically, there was a mis uh, mistaken identity um, about a fight that happened at Smithton Middle School, and she was um, arrested. And it took them all, about 24 hours to figure out that they had the wrong person. And in the aftermath of that, she's been uh, bullied and had issues at school, and it's pretty much gone unresolved. And uh, the girl who was actually in the fight also was, I think, really heavy-handedly. Um, punished, but I think the fight that she was in was also in response to bullying. So we've been hearing from a number of parents that their kids are experiencing bullying. They're afraid of, uh, concerned about over, um, over. We would like to see restorative practices in play with the prosecutors, um, with the school district, um, and with the police. So, and and with the juvenile authorities. So, we need we need these organizations to um, uh, talk to each other. And one of the things that we've noticed, um, as with Race Matters Friends, is how difficult it is for these institutions to be well, agile enough to to communicate and problem solve. So, I know it's possible because see Hollis meets with group of people every week and they talk about homelessness and where to put people and all that other kind of thing. So um, we do have a school to prison pipeline problem. We do have a discipline problem. We have a disparity with discipline. Um, and it's just, it's not obvious to me um, how restorative practice is integrated with. It's a good time for us to talk about interventions and I know a lot of parents have concerns that kids have special needs. That's an issue too. I've heard a similar complaint about their gifted program, which I think they should uh, scratch it. It's not a gifted program. So there, there's a lot of issues um, like that. And for me, uh, being a graduate student working with pre-service teachers, I'm, I'm concerned about how well we are preparing um, our students to go into the teaching workforce and be advocates uh, for, the, for, the, for the students and <laughs> challenge the system, right? Resist the system. So um, but I think that's a tall um, order in a field that is mostly all white and women, so. Okay. So I want to take this time to do um, just introductions. What brought you in today to the, today's meeting? You saw the invitation on Facebook or you got an invitation by someone here. Um, so let's just go around, including Peggy. And we'll start with Peggy. <laughs> um, what, what brought you to today's meeting? What you hope to learn? And we we do have it's gonna be a little different meeting. We do have some charts sheets over there that uh, later on or throughout the meeting I can facilitate and write down ideas that maybe we can use later on for our action plan or wrap up side session. So I want it to be like a working meeting per se because I know some of us are here to like fix shit, so. Peggy. Yeah, I'm Peggy Placer, and um, I usually come to meetings, but this is a really important one because uh, 
like crazy. I retired now, but I have worked in teacher ed and other programs in the College of Education. And this is uh, an issue that's been going on for decades and still is not resolved. And it's exacerbated by state laws and local public policy. So we have to keep working on it. I'm Lynn Maloney, I'm your vice president. We went to school board last week, we met several of you and discovered, you know, there's a lot of energy to actually get something uh, organized and accomplished. So that's why I'm here. I'm Eve Solbrook and I am in, interested in uh, special ed IEP behavioral issues, particularly with respect to youth, but also in transition to adulthood because I am a mom and a tech mentor and a lawyer. I'm Christina Angolia. Um, I am with SEPTA. I'm a member, but I'm also the Vice President of Missouri Disability Empowerment Mode. Um, and we are, we hear your concerns. We have other concerns related to racial matters, and I'm sure Michelle can share some of them better than me, even with CPS specifically, but we're listening and we want to figure out ways we can work together too. My daughter has disabilities, which is kind of how I got into this side of work. Yeah. My name is Michelle Robato. I'm um, with the Columbia Special Education PTA. I'm also a member of Missouri Disability Empowerment, so we all kind of work together. Um, I have two children with disabilities. I have three kids, but two of them with disabilities. So I'm also interested in the special ed side um, and have, through their journey, researched and learned a lot. So then I also go in with other parents to just sit and be parent support. And then um, in that journey, I've been researching and finding like um, kind of along this discipline issue, the percentage of kids with IEPs, their discipline rate versus non-IEP kids, and so just one thing leads to another, and um, so we're beginning with the push to record meetings to start, and that's our um, initial push, and then we're, um, so that's what we've been at the school boards um, talking about right now. So you were in the paper this week that they don't want to, uh, Yes, we've, yeah, we've been pushing, um, and we're still, we're going to keep going. Wow. So you want, you, do you want to just say something briefly about that? Yes, we, um, there's a school board policy. Missouri is a one-party consent state, so you can go in at any time with any conversation you're having with someone and have a recorder in your pocket. It's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. um, the CPS policy specifically says any um, meeting held for special, like the IDEA, so the 504 meetings, the IEP meetings, any type of meeting for special ed is not allowed to be recorded. And um, we just, we feel that that goes against the law, and there's other states that that is just part of the way their culture is, is you record those meetings. There are numerous, numerous um, advantages to recording, protection on parent side and child side and school side. You know, so it identifies those meetings specifically? specifically those so meetings. other stuff at school, okay. But IP meetings? I, they tell you that it's not allowed, but they specifically call out the IEP. And 504 is to meet a parent's Why do you want those, yeah. why, do you, why do you want those meetings? No. So just give notes. Okay. Oh, okay. And then, um, so we, we're pushing to have those recorded. <laughs> My name is Amy Gott. They tried to send my child to a pipeline in prison. And this far, we've dodged a lot of bullets. So, I uh, met you guys, you know, outside the, the board meeting the other day. And I would like to help um, give insight and, and help fix the system if I can. Uh, I'm Renee Carter, I'm a member of Race Matters, and uh, one of my areas of interest is um, racial disparities in the uh, pipeline to prison that goes on in the school. And uh, so I've been attending the school board meetings and hope to uh, come up with an action plan so that we can address all of those issues um, with the school and try to help them be better educationists. Carl Woody Griggs, I'm a member of Race Matters Friends. Usually I'm on boy duty at night, so I haven't been able to come to meetings, but this one, um, we have two boys, both of whom have special needs, uh, and we pulled them out of public school this year to avoid that very thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pipeline, both of them were driving and everything. Mm -hmm. 
Nope, I've seen many things where, where, where it will happen. Where are they then now? In private uh, school, homeschool? We're homeschooling. You're homeschooling? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed your first name. Oh, it's Tara, T-A-R-F-E. <laughs> I'm also an RMS data person. And we're recording this. This is Facebook Live. I apologize, I didn't ask. I hope everyone's okay. Or Facebook Live. I would have changed out my look a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you look fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I think just a quick, quick parenthesis. I think the, way, the reason we Facebook Live is transparency. We're asking for these institutions to be transparent with us, mm -hmm. families, public, um, and so we do the same. We're transparent as much as possible. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Okay, you're good. Uh, and I'm David. I am a newly minted doc doctoral person in educational leadership and policy. Um, most of you all are here because of maybe a personal reason. No, I don't want to look like you. <laughs> Wait, you're on. You need to be on. Yes. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Oh, transparency. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right? Mr. Transparent. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think one of the things I've been always interested in is how do we help our educators help our children? Uh, from day one, since I entered school as a student teacher, then a counseling, a uh, psychologist, then a doctoral student, then a preschool teacher. Um, I saw gaps in how our educators, although well-meaning, they were mistreating our students, especially students either with special needs or students of color who just had a, just a difference of living life. And so, um, well-intentioned, that's the key, is people are well-intentioned, educators are well-intentioned, leaders are well-intentioned, but somehow they're missing either the skills or the support from higher administration to do the things that they need to do. So I'm here, I've been involved throughout the past five, six years in figuring out how do we best equip them or change the system, either policy or power or something to empower them, educators, to, to serve the needs of our students. I'm Andrew Twaddle, I'm a member of Grace Matters Friends, and. Uh, we're no, I'm no longer really involved with the schools that much. Uh, my kid, my youngest child is now 50, and uh, so the, my grandchildren are in school systems uh, in other states. Uh, but you know, while they were in school here, we were dealing with uh, issues of uh, racism, particularly around uh, discipline in the schools. Uh, it, my kids were not being particularly disciplined, but black kids were, and uh, you know, it, it started off by relationship with the schools and saying this was not an environment where I wanted my kids to be and I needed something needed to be done uh, to straighten that out. Uh, I've been much more involved with the uh, community policing issues than with the school issues here and uh, I think I will continue in that, in that general direction. Uh, I am at the, at the cusp of leaving early tomorrow morning for uh, five months out of state. Uh, so I'll be seeing you back in November, I guess. But. Have you been at all involved with either the school policing or involved with the crisis intervention team? No, I mean, when my kids were in school. The school there were no there was no school policing. Yeah, I mean, like and recently. Just, okay, yeah. so recently you you're not. Yeah. You, okay. No, I haven't been. No. Okay. Right. I've been involved with school board races, that kind of thing. I worked with the uh, Dallas pretty <laughs> below, below, you know, campaign and. Okay. Uh, so that's really the level of my engagement at this point. So, so we're aware that the, that this department has a crisis intervention team, and we're aware of base, and we're aware of bridge and other programs. And so, um, even with those programs here, um, we still have disparities, and we still have a clamor for dollars, and we still. Um, everyone is feeling overwhelmed uh, in the system, but also everyone wants to follow the rules of the way, how their particular system works. So our challenge is how, how do we disrupt those system mechanisms that, that keep us from really uh, doing the work that, that's good for human beings, right? 
So that's our, our challenge. So the over-disciplining issue is huge. Um, I think the way the crisis intervention team works is it's, it's uh, involved more with when they have calls and people have an illness and all that other kind of stuff. Those other programs are supposed to be trying to pick up the slack for so many young people and families who don't have insurance and don't have access to um, uh, medical care and, men and mental health care. And so there's, a, you know, there's that challenge of, of getting people access to those services. Um, I spoke to someone today who said that she's able to get access to a therapist on her phone with an app through her health insurance, which is great. But what happens if you don't have um, health insurance or you don't have a phone or you don't have access to the internet? Um, so anyway, those are, those are just things to, um, uh, to think about. But specifically, our interest is how do we get these institutions to um, talk to each other? <laughs> and how do we get them to set meaningful um, intervention goals so that the disparities come down? And their, their response is not, well, we're doing all these great things. That's fabulous. You can do great things and fix your shit at the same time. So that's, yeah, you know, that's, that's the, I think that's <coughs> the challenge is they immediately get defensive. And we saw this with the police department. Whenever we bring something up, it was like, well, we're, we're good people. Well, no one's saying that you're bad people, but you've had these persistent disparities and, and clearly we need to retool or do something uh, for them to change. So um, how, do, how do school police officers meet with the schools and the police? Uh, where, where, where currently do they all meet? I mean, do they have a weekly meeting or monthly meeting or something where they, there must be some way the officers that are sit, sitting in the schools. So, so what I learned this week that's important is they don't have an officer sitting in the school. The officer that the manages schools. the middle schools is the officer for all the middle schools. Is that one guy you're talking about? He's the officer for all the middle schools. So he's the school, he, resource, school resource officer. How does he um, then communicate with the schools and with the police department, like between the two of them? Where do they have a meeting? Where, where does he attend? Does he attend meetings of school officials? Does he attend meetings where he reports to the police department what's going on in the schools? So I think those are good questions to get from. Um, Interim Chief Jones. Um, what I saw this week was not in, very integrated or seamless. Um, what I heard was the sergeant say, you need to talk to Mike Hester um, because he manages the community outreach team to get answers from him. But Mike Hester uh, manages a three geographic target area and they're supposed to be practicing community policing as a department. So it's not Mike Hester's part. Uh, you know, responsibility. This guy should be able to answer more than we just do the criminal side. So my, my answer to you is he's saying that in front of this guy who's the school resource officer. So that tells me that there's not a <laughs> there's not a communication thing going on because if there were they never really implemented that whole idea of community policing, correct? Well that, so that was the thing with Ken. So so yeah. So so there's two things going on. One, the school district says we practice restorative justice. So my question is, if you practice restorative justice, why are you arresting a, the wrong kid um, and you don't have your facts all together before you do that? Yeah. Why are you over-penalizing kids? Well, and even behavioral training, the police officers in Columbia, they have a program. They're supposed to be trained in managing behavioral. So so I, I want to give, I, if it were up to me, quite honestly, I really don't want police in the schools. But, um, I think we should have more counselors and we have more social workers. And even if they get one social worker for the police department, that's not enough because our, our disparities are that thick. So I don't I really don't want to put anything else on the on the police's table uh, other than how do we get them to talk to each other? Because that part's free. Right? It doesn't cost anything to talk to each other. So CPS has a restorative ju justice program practice. Which, you know, we need to, we need, if they're going to have SROs in the school, they should be practicing the same thing. So what I saw on Monday is, that's not happening. They'd like for it to happen, but it's not happening. When I talked to the chief, he says, yes, I have been to um, their restorative justice training sessions. They do it at, at Battle High School. So how we know there's a problem when LGBTQ kids put their flyers up there, it can get taken down. Or they're arresting our kids at the school, like they arrested the kids at uh, West Junior High. So 
I need some evidence of their how they come into this decision to um, arrest kids mm -hmm. and uh, their charges are pressed against them and or we're kicking kids out of school. So the crisis intervention team, as far as I can tell, has very little to do with what goes on at the schools. Um, that their officers are overwhelmed and they don't have the skill set all, all ways to do social yeah, work. Like, my, my thought is that if they're supposed to, I feel like sometimes if you work with them, I, I'm not saying physically, but I mean if we, all, if we work within the context of what already exists and it's supposed to be going on, it can, you can have faster progress than if you try to do something completely new. And I mean, they're supposed to be doing, and I have seen firsthand that some of these folks do have good behavioral intervention training. So it's not, it seems like it's not consistent. It's not permeating through the whole fabric of the police department and, um, or the school district. Yes. And, or the and prosecutors. Surely, surely. Or the prosecutors. Well, the prosecutors, the... I just, that, and I think you're, that's a communication, but surely the police department should all have some basic behavioral intervention uh, training. So, and that's, I think right now it's supposed to be happening. And I agree with you that if it's not, it's not our problem that they're understaffed. That's their problem. So, so, I, so all, all I'm saying is for the purpose of our conversation, I'm not interested in discussing their numbers of staffing. That's all I'm saying. Yep. In terms of their training, um, you know, there's a, a lot of argument that, that we have, they already want to do building inclusive communities. I, I think that's insufficient. Um, they lowered their education requirements to be a, a police officer to high school. So you have a number of, of, I don't want to call them esoteric things, but you have a number of things on the, on the table. Um, you also have a lot of young officers. Um, if you don't have a bachelor's degree or have any background in sociology or um, uh, child development or anything like that, it's, yeah. those are, I mean, so, I, yeah, I got pulled over by a police officer for a um, traffic violation that wasn't me, it was the other guy. And, and the police officer truly thought what I had done was wrong. He didn't know that the law is the other way. It was with respect to a term. But I called the Columbia Police Department and they verified that, in fact, it was me that was correct. And so this guy just kind of sheepishly walked away. But they don't even necessarily know the law. So that, <laughs> when we, when we know that already. Yeah. Um, so that, so those are, the, those, are the cultural, should, those are the cultural problems that they have to fix in the department. So, yeah. so they understand what I, I think part for me is, along with this conversation, is around what you all were saying, SEPTA, the SEPTA group, uh, Como for SEPTA, SEPTA for Como, Como SEPTA. Uh, is, is, is just a formal procedural guidelines of, okay, so, and is it okay that the public or families at the very least understand of why are students getting suspended? What was the protocol that was followed? Let me put the camera in front of you because you're getting cut off. Well, I just want to tap my face. What? And so, yeah, and so and so I think for me also is so training is important and right now I think our for instance CPS Columbia Public School is doing their best at the time to provide training for their teachers <clears throat> should that be uh, improved yes but different conversation but I think right now is okay so what are the procedures for that one student student plus a plus that we're calling her uh, for confidentiality purposes um, she was arrested wrongly, right? Um, and it wasn't until they watched the video that they saw that she it was the wrong person. So who's uh, in CPS and the secretaries or the teachers or whoever's calling the the officers? What procedures are they following? We want to know that. Do they have any written policy specifically? Because we've been digging through their policy for other reasons, but is there a policy on the books, allegedly, at least? I'm told, that they, have, I'm told that they have a policy and a protocol. Um, well, and that's what they keep saying, is I keep hearing that personally, is that there's policies okay. and protocols, like we got an email today or yesterday, it's based on our protocol, okay, so, can we, yeah, can do, we they, do they not publish that? I take it. The policies are published on their website, okay. and I've read some of them. I did not see a policy about arrest, but I can. Okay. Well, there's okay. nothing on their website in their equity department that talks about. They say they do restorative justice, but there's not. No, not well, no I know. Yeah. So, that so we've asked. Them. Them. We're gonna, we're gonna, attention. we're gonna meet with them, and so Aviv has already asked us for. What is your equity curriculum? So that should be relevant to you also and your concern. Um, what is your what is your what is your training like? 
Um, one of the things that concern me is how are they getting feedback on if a training is working. Um, initially, when they started their equity training, it was um, voluntary, um, and now it, it is required. Um, this is the schools, this is the teachers. Okay. Well, but the, it goes both ways, right? It, will, it goes right now. I think I think we're dealing in this inter interesting situation where race matters. Friends started with uh, the police department, but now we're seeing the police department uh, missing something. Something is going on there where the police department is involved, and black students are arrested wrongfully. Or if they're arrested, they're arrested at 12 years of age or six years of age or, you know. Um, so once again, right. So once again, is it's not just CPS, but also the, the police department. And so right now, I think it's, it's, it's okay for us to have the conversation of how do we, what do we do? So Are for... Are you the prosecutor? Have you talked to the, what's the I, don't know, I don't know what the current status is of the <clears throat> prosecutor's view on all this or what they're pursuing or not pursuing? What's, what so I think, I, I think it's important to say that prosecutors get elected by prosecuting people, right? Because we built up this thing that we need to fear people and we should do very harsh punishment and discipline. So prosecutors get elected by saying, I'm hard on crime, I'm hard on crime. Yeah. right. So, and they have the discretion um, <coughs> to practice restorative uh, measures, right? They have the discretion to do that. So we need um, the prosecutors and the judges and the school district and the police department to work together a lot more closely. Um, I've heard too many stories about uh, students who, uh, students with special needs um, being punished or being humiliated. Um, and you don't even have to have special needs because students are get humiliated fairly often. Right. And and those are those are just uh, I think pedagogical problems with with teachers, right? So there's there's quite a number of, of mess piles, but I, I do think that um, it's important to understand do their policies actually address um, students getting uh, arrested? Do their policies address what types of infractions constitute um, arrest? Um, I heard a story today where there were four kids in a car. Um, the 16-year-olds, they no problem, but the 17-year-olds got charged much more harshly. Yeah, some, some, I have, I have also observed some law enforcement really loves that Missouri has the law that allows them to treat a 17-year-old like an adult, and some don't. It's not consistent at all. And, and DJOs are the same way. Some of them are very pro, you know, hard, hard line. You're 17 years old, you're treated like an adult. Right. Some people are like, I guess maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not more versed in the story of justice, but of it, um, appropriateness for that age. They're more concerned about, um, about that. I, I don't think that punishing harsh is working for us. Yeah, so, Peggy? Not. Yeah, well, several years ago, the General Assembly criminalized things in schools that were formerly called discipline or behavior management or classroom management or whatever it was. They redefined kids' behavior at any age as coming under criminal classifications like assault. Before it was a fight on the playground, now it's assault. And it enabled the school then to enlist the police in that process. So we also have a problem with state law. And that's what the school district will lean on. Well, we're, you know, we're supposed, we have to do this. We ran into this uh, with the issue of ICE coming in and enforcing policies. Um, and the school district said, well, we just, we do just what we're supposed to do by the law. Oops, um, so they will also lean on that. And I'd like to know if the, how that varies across districts. How many districts just wash their hands and say it's state law, I can't do anything about it. And how many of them avoid the criminalization avoid referring these behaviors to uh, 
you know, police it by or criminalize it. And in Missouri, does any do any school districts get training on this? And if so, what does that look like? Because and it should be uniform across districts, school districts. Well, because administrators do, but not. Well, then those administrators. Teacher. That's good though. Then they need to filter it down, you know. And so and, for SEPTA, I'm wondering just where you all stand in this conversation, and um, I know there's many things probably going on uh, in your agendas. Um, but given the conversation that we've had just now. Yeah, well, um, in terms of SEPTA statements, since we haven't voted on certain policies, I can keep, speak on myself, you know, for myself, but not for SEPTA, except for the recording policies. And um, I think kind of what we run into is where there are policies in place and they, there's the belief, you know, that that, that that is what happens, but in reality, that does left a lot of times, and so kind of trying to get those situations, and I think that's a lot of this too, because I mean, it's been, I don't know a lot about restorative justice, so I'm gonna go home and Google that and learn about that a little bit, but I'm wondering if it's kind of that same thing like what you were talking about, where it's, yes, that's appropriate, that's so the student what should happen, but is it actually happening is my, my guess, so I wanna check into that a little bit. So before we criminalize being a teenager, and I was joking earlier about the kids at West and I said, you know, I would meet him on Saturday morning and wear your work clothes. That was, you know, you would, you would, you would restore what you, you did in, to the community, right? So it's a learning process, it's an opportunity to talk things out. Your kids are fighting, you bring them all in the room and you have a conversation with them, how you solve this problem, right? So it, it, should, it should be a mechanism for adults to model conflict, conflict resolution, and model engagement, and we need the police to do it. So I'm not saying that um, Officer Ash is not modeling, um, doing good engagement with the students and all that. I am saying that uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's um, institutionalized in such a way that it's consistent, right? Because there's a lot of fighting and a lot of bullying um, um, at the schools. And the other big part of it, it's not just addressing the kids, it's also how do you bring the parents in and the families in and the community in to also learn how to do that um, you know, conflict resolution and conflict management. So it sounds to me like a lot of parents are banging up against the door, right? They're knocking on the door and they're like, well, hey, actually, we really don't feel like answering the door today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of like what we're experiencing talking to CPS, which is we've been doing all these great things it takes a long time, it's a journey. That's fabulous, no one's against change. But you know, while you're working on the change, we also need to deal with your crisis that you have. So what's been filed is a complaint, not a lawsuit. So to me, that's an opportunity and an opening to um, make, you know, make some adjustment. And I think she's comfortable, the mother is comfortable in speaking with the child, they're comfortable in using this as an example too, right. Right. for CPS to, and the district to get their act together. I'm glad that SEPTA exists. I'm wondering if, do PTAs in general still exist? Yes. Yeah. Are they active? In the depends, depends. 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 They're mostly fundraising. That's what I thought of mice. They not have a PTA from what I understood. Which one? They have a PTO. PTO. Yeah. I'm very concerned about that. I am very concerned about that. My son's school, I live in Boonville, and they have a, what you're saying. It is only a fundraising tool, and they bring food in for teachers and teacher appreciation week or whatever. But they don't have meetings about the issues going on in the schools. So mm -hmm. SEPTA, and there used to be actually power in those parent-teacher mm -hmm. associations. So we do a lot of like member education and out, I'm sorry, I'm just yeah. jumping in there, but, and we also, you know, take positions. So our first official position that we've taken is on this recording policy. I will speak from the mode side of things. We have also have some concerns about um, bullying. Um, there was actually an excellent policy written that went through Modesi and had been approved. It was a law actually. Um, when the law was written, it did not have a component that required enforcement and publishing it on the website at Modesi. So there's this great policy out there that no one is using. So there are, there are many issues like this, you know, that I, they don't quite align exactly with what you all are saying, but I think they're working towards each other because it's the same story <laughs> in a different context. It's a sibling yeah. of a larger problem. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so first I'd want to know, I want to look and see what is actually the policy and protocol. So we're with something in writing from them to see. So we're then, we're going to have a meeting with them, and those are things that they're supposed to talk about. Okay. And um, I, I found a few things on student discipline, and it's they're talking about how they have to report all crimes, but then when it talks about like people being in a mutual fight, uh huh, it talks about administrators to do conference detention in school suspension. One to 180 days out of school suspension or expulsion, restitution if appropriate, may lose privileges of their contraband, loss of parking, and loss of technology. And that comes, that covers arson, assault, I mean, all these different things. So there's like two different ways they can pursue this, these issues, and they could do both. I think. More, than, more than two ways. And so, it does say, too, that the, that the principals at the school are ultimately responsible for how those things are enacted, and which means that they need to have additional policy regulations, et cetera, in place. So there's this macro level policy that's pretty vague, right? And I think what for, happens at the school yeah, level yeah, yeah. is another well, layer of documentation to ask for. Yeah, which I think is really good. What, what I'm hearing here is that the school's policies are all focused on punishment. Yes. Rather than education. From the quick preview. Yes. Yeah. So and, where and, are and the restorative need practices model. in the policy? Yeah. yeah. So yes. this, okay, so wait, this let's, let's clear this up. Let's clear this up. Are, so there, are there restorative practices listed in their policies? I did not. I didn't see anything. That the I didn't see anything. So that means that the CPS, district-wide, this is uh, school policies focus on punishment, mm -hmm. criminalization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, they're, but they're trying to say that we have an equity team mm -hmm. that is supposed to provide training to individual schools mm -hmm. to then fight this criminalization policy. Like, it's almost counterproductive. Who is supposed to be providing training? There's an equity officer. What's she called? I mean, it's Carla Linden. Yeah. No, but it's what's called her? the equity office. Yeah, yeah equity office. They're supposed to be training schools around restorative practices. But there's no information on the website about what that entails. Right. Well, so, but, but at the same time, so, he, I mean, okay, so he, this is a scholar in me, it's like, mm -hmm. it's contradictory. Mm -hmm. You have this larger policy yeah. yes. that working mm -hmm. against what Carla London <coughs> is trying to do, and it's almost like Carla London is against this big, pushing against this big giant. What about this new chief of police that people like, so they do like him, right, better? Is so, this... so I, I did talk to Jeff twice today, and so um, I want to go back to this um, equity team. Um, equity officer, I'm, I'm always suspect when um, we're doing something good but it's not written, written into the policy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to, I, David said good intentions and um, I would like to change the language to um, something else. And you might often say to me that, it's, hear me say, it's by design. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we, we live in, <laughs> you know, a very uh, hierarchical, colonized type of things. And so it's by design um, that it doesn't work, Yes. right? So Jeff is a great guy, he's only one person and he cannot change all of it by himself. Um, our job as uh, the public is to say, uh, by the way, this is great that you have Jeff and the community policing plan that you have was DOA, where's the new one, right? You passed a revolution, it says you're gonna do community policing, Last February, you're still fucking around. So where is it, right? Call me Same public schools. Yeah, call me public schools. You say that you're doing restorative practices, but you don't have a. We don't see your policy manual. It's not on your website. Um, your policies only address punishment. Um, what are you going to do about that? Those are reasonable questions and answers. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree with you about that because. <coughs> Programs and you know special initiatives and all that. Even staff people, if they're not regular line staff, are ephemeral. Mm -hmm. They come and go. I mean, there's and the teachers will tell you every year it's something new. You know, so they get kind of cynical about this. And but what's on paper and what the board is supposed to deal with? I mean. If, if they're really sincere about this restorative stuff, they need to change the policy. Well, and this, this, reading through this, this reads to me very similarly to the police policy 
manual out of the box. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We bought it from here, and these are our policies. They we change names. They so bought it from Missouri and the school SBA. board association. Okay. Perfect. We're so, what, to me, what's, what's important about that, sorry, I don't know, um, is then the policies are actually not reflective of the, of the espoused values, right? They're, it's impossible for them to On to purpose. Them. On okay. purpose, right? And so it gives them an out. Oh, we have this policy that we, and then the conversation ends. And that's by design. And so you just defer to the policy and you hope that everybody shuts up. Uh, but if, if you have a mission that is supposed to be about student thriving and da da da, everything has to get measured against those goals. And this, these don't. And this VA yeah. is a huge problem for us too. Um, really? and because they're, they have policies. What's that again? Um, Missouri <laughs> State Board Association, um, they create a lot of policy yeah, and then it's just adopted by CPS. Um, and you know more about it than me, but yeah. So basically, they put out the policies and then the school boards basically adopt them and that's pretty mm -hmm. much what's happened. So that's the issue that we're having with the employee <laughs> policy is it's just a blanket put out by MSBA. And um, so we're struggling, we're trying to work with CPS to get them to understand why it needs to be changed. We're reaching out to MSBA, we haven't heard back yet, trying to, because we're trying to bring it to their attention that it's um, you know, discriminatory. So, so I, I want to read Rita's message, Rita Vega. She says, um, Yes, the, okay, so she says, sounds to me the CPS needs to be embraced for sort of justice as first practice rather than punitive measures. Mm -hmm. The school board and administrators must take this on as a whole. So that means that in a way, what Rita is suggesting and what we're all in a way talking about, maybe we need to, Tracy, we need to like tackle MSBA. Uh, she says like police and community policing and guarding rather than warrior justice. You want to say something? I don't know if this is going to be useful. This is just notes I've made while you guys have been um, talking. But, you know, I heard the, what occurred, what do they mean by restorative justice? Um, and and we can read the policies till I'm blue in the face, but um, my, my initial, you know, thought was that we needed to look at the tier program at MU. Um, the tier that. program. What are you talking about? The tier program. Um, it's a it's a program that MU I think is trying to push um, nationwide. Um, but it's it's a it's a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid you have like you know green, and then it goes yellow, and then it goes red. This three tiered system. Um, if your if your child's in the green, you know you you do these practices whenever they're you know they have these behaviors. If they all oh, categorize them, oh yeah. the parents at, the parents at Grant have absolute shit. Though. So yeah, so, so you get to yellow, well, so I, and they I, do I, other things. You get yeah. to red, and they I guess restrain you, get you to police, so, you know whatever. So our our problem is is we keep thinking if we standardize something. It's yes. Yeah. yeah. So every time we create a structure, um, yes. we're squeezing people's brains out, right? I, yeah. I mean, that's my that's my opinion. No room so, for so here, so here's here's yeah. where the control starts. They have these uh, policies that they bought from the Missouri State Board of Association, and because they're lazy, they're intellectually lazy, right? They they don't want to take the time, right, to sit down and say, what does our community need? We have the same thing in the police department. We buy these things from off the shelf because it, it, it gets them off the hook. So it, we'll take the police department, for example. What is their policy on social media? What is their policy on police officers using social media? They're talking racist, sexist, classist. What is that? Where is it? Not there. Okay. Columbia Public Schools, right? They talk about restorative practices. It's not in their policies. We do the same thing with the city. Oh, we have a social equity strategic plan. That's a program. Someone dies, it goes away. Someone gets fired, it's done. Carlin quits that job, it's done, right? There's nothing, there's nothing in writing. Even for the curriculum, right? We have no, we have no data that shows that it works. We don't have anything. So, first of all, the tier system, like that we use at MU, I don't think it works. Uh, we do it with our students, it doesn't work. Uh, but CBS is following it. Yeah. And, well, they like, yeah, they, they, they like rules. PBIS. They, 
Yeah. 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 So every child is designated either green, yellow, or red already, like now. It's just in terms of how you should respond. If, so it's like it's like giving them a list. If they do this, then you do oh, this. Oh, a red one. So yes, but that gets you have to restrain. But, but that gets you in trouble, right? That gets you in trouble because. What if you've done something to trigger a kid, yeah. and that's not in the red or the blue or the green or the yellow zone, right? Well, and, and how, how handy if you don't like someone to maybe trigger someone who happens to be in the red. Which so happens all the time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or if your kid has anxiety, yeah. and they're in One, yellow, they freak out, and you get out of the okay. Christina? One thing we found, too, is that sometimes Desi actually has better policy than MSBA, and for whatever reason, CPS seems to adopt the MSBA, and so, I, and I, I can't speak, well, I'm not saying always, but once in a while you're like, oh, that's pretty good, yeah, so, it is ridiculous, so, I, and I can't speak to the specific issue, but I would think that this group would want to look at if Desi has a policy on restorative justice or something along those lines, because if they do, then you can say, hey, you should be following Modesi, our state board of ed, um, as opposed to... I do think it, it would be helpful, it, it sounds like from whatever, and I know this is my first meeting here, but even for me, um, to know what everybody's formal, official things are supposed to be. What are their policies? What are their groups? What's supposed to be going on, first of all, so that at least we can try to make, make sure to start off by enforcing that. So yeah, that's one of my requests for Carla Landa. We and one, for one, several, one again is I, I, I don't want to bash, and this is something that I want to reemphasize, I don't want to bash the person. Right, Carla London, I think she's doing a job that she was inherited within a climate of what I'm calling Little Dixie, that we probably know what that is, this mentality of colonialism or Jim Crow, uh, that it's not going to go away anyway. So Carla London is doing the best job. Some of our administrators, leaders are doing the best job. I think what I want to do here tonight is fix it. Um, but it's like coming up with a way of, so where, where, where can we inter interject? <coughs> Right, you you all accept that. I think that was admirable that you all went <coughs> 7 a.m. on Monday morning to talk to about policy, talk to the CPS board about policy or whoever it was. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to interject ourselves in the structure. You talk about design, Tracy. So where can we interject ourselves? So the way we interject ourselves, Mike, and I want to come back to your your. Uh... So I think one of the first interventions is pushing them to communicate with each other, right? So we need Peter Siegelman, we need the police chief, we need the prosecutor's office, um, we need the equity team, we need the prosecutors, we need all those people to get at the table. The, the jail folks have an overcrowding meeting every month, so there's already a slot they can have a special meeting and call people to come in and talk about that because the school to prison pipeline is connected to that. Um, in terms of, of um, uh, special needs and all that other kind of stuff, they, they have a special needs person with the district, they have a curriculum person with the district. These people are already there, it's not rocket science. They should make themselves visible and more accessible to the community. Um, just to throw a wild card out there, we have a very powerful, very popular Parks and Recreation Department. They can be a conduit, con a conduit right? A bridge to having a lot of conversations. The truth of the matter is that these organizations are not used to um, regularly interacting and communicating and making decisions together. They make, dis they make decisions in their silos. You too wonder what they're doing. Jeez. Nothing. Uh, anyway, so, uh, no, that's not true. They are doing stuff, but they do. They they do. So, so, so my issue is I feel that uh, a lot of students are dehumanized um, by our, uh, our practices don't, that don't view all of our children as equally human. Right? Um, uh, people walk in with a, a lot of preconceived notions about this student can do this or this student can't do that. This yeah. red. This and, and so the reason yeah. I don't like the, the blue and the red and the green and all that is because um, people start looking for a way to categorize kids mm -hmm. rather than building relationships with them. Right. So if you have a relationship with a kid, it's kind of like my dad used to say if you're a good manager, you can tell someone to go to hell and they go smiling, right? So I'm not saying you should tell kids around to go to hell. I am saying that um, it's really important that we build relationships with students. And how else are we building infrastructure? We have a college of ed. Can we get mentors? Can we get tutors? I know we have field service 
How can we how can we torque that down so it's more meaningful? How do we get medical students to connect um, with those who are doing mental health? How do we get social work involved? So my other big question is: We have a land grant institution in this town. How does the university act as the anchor of equity in our community? Duh, crickets. Yeah. Well, actually, the university has some um, internal problems with that. So I know, I, like, I, I, yes. I, I'm there, I've been there yep. for a while. So all I'm saying is, so, we have this anchor of equity in the community, we have this college band, we have this medical school, we have this J school, we have all these, and so we're out here scrapping, and they have actually, and we talked to Munchoy and Alexander Cartwright about this, about the issue with the police officer who dressed up in blackface. Great, you fired the guy. Okay, why not have a larger conversation with the community so they, the, why they know that, why this is wrong. If you arrest someone and you made a mistake, you should make a public apology. You should say this should be our normal protocol. We screwed up. And you should be also allowed to make amends to try to fix things and to try to reintegrate into, this, into the community. That's, that's, yes. But that's like a no-brainer, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that should happen. Yeah. So, uh, so the intervention is yeah. we need to get these people to talk to each other. And Jeff has no problem talking with people. In terms of special ed, in terms of the intervention, I think we need to be really clear about what our demands are and what we want. Yes. And to say, okay, this is why we want the meetings televised, rather than we want the meetings televised to keep saying, why? When I lived in Long Beach, they wouldn't televise the meetings. One of the largest school districts in the country. So people started showing up with their own camera. They'd also vote everything up and down on the consent calendar in one vote, meeting less than five minutes, mm -hmm. right? So. So what, what is the value, what is the value for parents and families to have the meetings recorded? Well, we were trying to record IEP meetings specifically. So like when I'm going in for my daughter's federal rights to, um, for her goals, her academic goals, we sit down and have a two hour, three hour meeting. It's very emotional, it's very intense. And I bring friends to take notes and all that kind of stuff. And it's still overwhelming and I don't remember everything. So we're trying to record those specific meetings. So they won't let you record your own yeah. meeting? Correct. No. So they're private meetings okay. that, so would, not... that would, in theory, the district would do <coughs> become part of our record, you know, yeah. protected by function. Okay. Yeah. From a legal standpoint, I see I find it very interesting that they single out IEP meetings because they the reason they use for that is the protect, for protection of other students' rights. In an IP meeting, you don't really have no, other students' no. rights, but Correct. you do in other venues where apparently you can record, and we all know the schools themselves are recording. The, the problem exactly. is they're agreeing to certain things, and we're going to hold them to it. And, and it's not always bad, actually. I, personally, I've had decent IEPs thus far. So, but, okay, so I when I was never, I said it's by design. Right. So we, we were advocates this year for a family that was going to the Department of uh, Family Services, right? So they weren't recording the meetings. That meant the social worker or the case worker could write whatever they wanted in their notes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we saw the notes, this person was attributing something that somebody else said to this person, they could make this person look bad. And they said we couldn't take the meetings when we found out we could. Mm -hmm. So guess what? We started mm -hmm. taking the meetings and transcribing them. Guess what? They were saying all kinds of stuff. Now for sure, the last three social workers we've had have been excellent, right? We had to write letters and complain and all that. I don't understand why you can't tape your own meeting with your kid. The only reason they don't want you to tape the meeting is so they can change their mind, try to make you look like a fool and look crazy, well, and, and so, so they can maintain um, control. But I don't, I don't know if this is going to echo your experience, but in the work that I've done with another parent, it was so that they could then claim, oh no, 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 none of that ever happened, only they're dealing with a parent who's kept every single piece of paper. Yeah, that's this that's parent. Right text, here. Yeah, and every that's text yeah. that you, they've ever gotten. And so we can haul all that crap out and say, actually, you don't want to lie I also think so. schools fear the law. There's a lot of law yeah. associated with IEPs and IP meetings, and they're afraid they don't always get it right. And if I'm you sure. report it, it's, it's, and you it's have risk something they're actually using the lawsuit. Yeah, I but think that risk management is the answer. Yeah. No, they want you to be disempowered. They, yes. they, these institutions no, they thrive want. on confusion, right? Yes. yes, they're scared of litigation. That's the way the game is played. All I'm saying is Everyone you can, is. You can refuse the game. Yes. You can refuse the game. What are you going to do? Take me to court well, for we, recording my, my meeting with my kid? See you in court. Well, and that's the thing, too. Well, parents, it's one party. So parents yeah. have been recording. So right now, the school is not protected for those cases that go to due process. Mm -hmm. They're out there, you know, with the Yeah, parents, and what is the penalty to the parents? Well, that's the thing. You know, um, 
if you fear were mongering, you can't kick their kid out because no, if you walk out of that meeting, fear mongering. If, if they say no and you walk out of that meeting, then they can be a violation of, of providing a free and appropriate public yes. education. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can just keep saying, keep calling the meeting, saying I'm going to. So um, we right now are starting with the speed test board. We're we're working on that um, because we do feel that if there's no FERPA. Um, this morning on the radio, uh, Dr. Stiefman was on and said that it was there were possibilities of FERPA violations, which does not apply at all. It's just no, kind of trying to make it sound right. as if there's a FERPA. But no, I mean you're only talking about your child. All the guardians are in the room. All the parents are, you know, so there's no, none of that. So um, protecting teachers. They said teachers don't want it, but I think it's 50. I think it's probably 50 50. We've talked to teachers. There's fear of retaliation if they come forward to support this policy. Wow. And so they're hearing from the ones that say no, because that's the um, that's what's been put out there, is that we do not want this policy change. So it's easy to come out and say, yes, I agree. Um, and so we're, we're struggling with that a little bit, but um, we have some things in place. We've got, basically, we're concerned that um, it, there's kind of that um, mindset of sue us, and let's use the taxpayer dollars to pay for a lawyer instead of actually just making it a... So, so that's what's going on right now with the case in January, right? <coughs> so here, here's the thing that just gets me about this. We're talking about um, students uh, with disabilities or special needs. The most powerless mm -hmm. and vulnerable students, we want to disempower their parents. Mm -hmm. How bizarre is that? Oh, it, and it work. goes further. I mean, in terms of... I know there's like the discipline tiering that's a problem. Um, you're a red, you're a green. There's also, I mean, they'll segregate our children, no problem. And I say routinely to me, you cannot segregate my child. We decided that separate but equal is not equal. It's not right for any group of people, including my child. And they say, oh, well, you know, she's got these, you know, disabilities, so therefore she goes to this kind of disability it's classroom. It's restrictive and, environment. Oh, I know, that's but what it, that's what they claim, yes. but um, we're pushing back on that individually, too. I mean, and I can't speak for sector mode, but we have our hands in a few different pots there, but they have no problem taking, for example, my daughter will transition to kindergarten next year, and she is um, nonverbal, and they have a nonverbal classroom, and that's where they want to put her, and over my dead body will she be put there, but... Um, and it's not because we won't, can't interact with other kids that are nonverbal, but it's because she has a right to interact with everyone. This is a verbal world. <laughs> so I think that's something that we that we aren't talking about, and that is that a lot of a lot of teachers uh, don't have um, that skill set, mm -hmm. um, and also people are very trained um, to attach intelligence to having a certain verbal yeah. language. Oh, sure. So, so yeah. we, there's a lot of mm, a lot of fuzz and confusion about. Um, um, in, in what's intellectually acceptable in our society, right? Well, there were like their kids not if their kid has to deal with constant interruption by some other kid. There, a lot of people are worried. That's it. They claim that um, parents of typical kids have problems, but um, the research shows that it benefits all children in the room. And yeah. granted, you know, if there's an issue of violence to the point where people are being harmed, I'm, all right, we have other conversations we need to have there. But um, there's really no reason. You can't have the supports in place. It is, in fact, interfering somebody else's somebody else's fate. Right. In order to, yeah. But yeah, that's not even an issue. They won't even let my daughter step into a yeah. gen classroom, right. you know, yeah. and that's that's where. Well, the, that same desire to categorize yeah. happens, right? So right. Like, yeah. one of our other boys says he doesn't fit in a box, but they want to put him in one of the four spent boxes that they have for them. Yeah, they have autism classrooms. They have, like, diagnosis-specific He's classrooms. a polygon. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the part that we also don't discuss in education is that our, we don't have a one-size-fits-all um, way, of, even as beings ourselves. Right. We all have multiple identities and multiple identities and abilities, excuse me. And so in a classroom, I think, so I've seen some classrooms where they do have uh, kids in the class that have special needs. And I think it's wonderful how the other kids in the class are learning from them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's super, it's super, super powerful. And I, I think there's there's not a good translation in our society about how we can learn from people who learn differently, right? I don't even like using the word different, quite frankly. No, in my, my daughter's case, I mean, she will likely need caregivers at a certain point in her life that are not me, because I won't live forever, unfortunately, and, <coughs> or maybe fortunately, I don't know. But um, but those 
these kids who are around her are going to be her caretakers potentially. Mm -hmm. I want them to know she exists. Um, I want them to know that she can communicate with them. I want them to communicate with her. You know, I want all of you. She has a way of communicating. Yeah, right? She has a way of communicating and waiting. Right. That's acceptable. So anyway, I think Septa, I think it would be good for us to, um, and also um, Nene, for us to really, and Tara can help us with this, is really look at their policies, because mm -hmm. I think if it's not, if, they're, if, they're, if their policies about restorative practices are not explicit, we already know that there's probably not restorative practices in the police policies. Um, if we do get a community policing plan, it should address restorative practices. If we have prosecutors, um, we need to see that they've got some restorative practices. I know some of our judges are already on board and endorse some of the restorative practices. So restorative practice just, just means that we don't use a hammer to solve a problem and criminalize the, the transgression, mm -hmm. right? right? Especially for, for minors. So we didn't used to do this in my day. If you got in trouble, you did community service. Okay, and there's, there's also the seclusion and restraint. Oh, it's an issue. oh, oh God, it's really so horrible. Like and that happens all the time. It does. Well, the kids are We're not supposed to be in a room that has a locking mechanism on it. And so we're wow. trying to get that. Um, it's like prison. It's like creating yeah. a, a cage. It's, it's mm -hmm. not. Um, and so you, so there's just a lot of things that we're, we're trying to gather information on and, and get those practices changed. So it sounds like we have to dis dis still tear and dis disrupt norms about mm -hmm. about who is intellectually viable, yep. right? And disposable. And, um, and whether or not uh, the moving from deficit-based conceptions to Strengths. Strengths, but also community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I was at a presentation. A so of how, so how, yeah. often does, how often does yeah. her, your child's teacher, ask you to come into the classroom and short, share your funds and knowledge with your students about how you guys... We have parents it. individually do it. Um, and, and Lily is in the Early Childhood Special oh, wow. Education Program oh. on Smiling Lane. Yeah, sure. And it is a unique program because it is fully integrated. Um, they call it a SPED program, but um, three children in her room, which is about 50% of the children in her room, are typical children. They have no IEPs, and I love it. It's fully integrated. And her, some of her best friends are those typical kids. You know, they're just buds or whatever. Um, but that shifts. So there is a model that exists in Columbia for full integration, at least based on ability, um, but it doesn't continue on. Right. And yeah. we, that's one thing we can tell the parents is to really uh, talk and see if you can come in and talk to your child's class, because I think that's a biggie, you know. Um, uh, do an activity, right? You show mm -hmm. yes. show the kids how to think and do things. And it just depends in on the teacher right. and the right. whether they can do that. Right. Really for that. So that's something that we can do that really empowers um, parents. Um, we can even do those kinds of activities ourselves as a group to learn how to do something differently, um, learn ourselves to use different tools. Um, I brought my poster uh, today, so I'm trying to teach myself how to do things without uh, having a lot of text, right? So how can I think like with mapping and concepts and things like that? I'm, I'm very privileged to use uh, text and verbal, obviously, but what happens if I try to think in pictures, right? If I try to think in symbols. So that's new to me but there are a lot of people who are amazing right and thinking that way and so we need to make uh, room for other ways of thinking and other ways of, of being and so we're always sort of pushing up against this hegemonic stuff right like this is the way it's always been since the 19th century yeah okay so um can i ask I, a question yeah so you know we were talking about getting everyone together have, have you just kind of set out an invitation, like this day, this time, at this place, I'm inviting you, 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 and you. Let's so we, we've or? already have a request into Carla London. To, okay. <coughs> so we have a team. If, if one of you guys want to come, that's fine. Um, but I think I think at the same time as... We're not trying to overwhelm them. No, we're no, trying right. to... No, but there's, there's multiple things going mm -hmm. on, right? Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. We, so, so, so I interrupted you, but we do have a meeting with Carol London, so, who is the equity officer. We know her because she's above SPED. So, yeah. so, so, my, so my question to you is, what is unresolved in terms of your wants and needs from the equity office? So my question would be, how is the equity training addressing the issues that you care about relative to discipline 
and relative to the way they categorize SPED, you know, how are they providing their educators with ongoing resources so they have the tools to know that there are way more than four types of whatever, right? So getting, getting people to think besides the boxes is very hard, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so what, what, so I, I, don't, I don't know what's in her equity training about uh, if you have an autistic kid or you have uh, a child that has a physical, I don't know, right? We haven't seen that, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think incidents happen and people are not uh, aware of the spectrum of autism and if you corner um, a, a kid, you can cause a lot of, of problems. Um, and so I don't think all teachers are equally uh, competent yeah. to handle those. It's not their fault, but sometimes we want things in the classroom and the teacher doesn't have it. Right. So I would want to know, if we were meeting with Carla, we're going to say, Septa, these are these, are these things. Uh, what's, her, what's her name right there? Amy. Amy has these concerns about um, uh, discipline or deficit-oriented thinking or whatever these you know concerns are, or yes. of over over punishment, you know how how are you? So none of this is new. They've been feeling this stuff. So so one of the things what's really interesting, just almost like a side conversation, no, like a meta conversation, is this is not even a race issue, right? This is it's, it's not it's not only a race issue. It's 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 a it's an issue about how are educators treating students who are just different. Which is why we, we invited you all. Yeah, in terms of sped, I mean, obviously not every teacher is the same, and not every teacher has the same philosophy, but I do think um, sometimes it's out of the hands of teachers, particularly with sped. Um, there's, um, you'll have teachers who say, oh, I hear you, I see this need, and but then we have to say no because the powers that be above them say no. So I don't know that it's always teachers. No, I, yeah, I, and I was, I was saying that, that. They, they they can't they, they can't always accommodate what right. our what our needs are. Yeah. But we just need to know that. Right? I mean, so how do you how do you get how do we create an environment where they'll say, Hey, I can do this, but I can't do this, but then we can meet you over here to, to do to do this. I think parents end up doing a lot of pedaling and a lot of, of running. And I think that the district can make it easier. So I think one of the just to ask you again what could Tracy's asking you all is, uh, so what's the big ask for you all right now? The for recording Septa? policy. Right now it's recording is what we're focusing on. Because um, we feel like that will help not only parents that are able to go in, but I think that will help some of those parents that either can't go, um, maybe have to have that the IEP meeting has to be held without them, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether you know, that type of stuff. So I think like that's kind of a broad and an easy, easy change. It can be a very easy um, step in the right direction. Maybe. Yeah, I had a thought about that, but I didn't want to go back to it until you did. Because you say it's in the pol it is in the district policies that these particular meetings cannot be recorded. Correct. Correct. We know they got those policies from MSBA. The reason they adopt those policies is because MSBA has them vetted by attorneys. But it's so the school board thinks if we just adopt this word for word, we're we're covered. You know, we won't be sued. But there's nothing that says that policy couldn't be locally changed and vetted uh, by somebody else who has a different legal opinion and. It absolutely, I mean, we've got these two new school board members. They are probably unaware of this practice. No, they're on board with us. We have a forum with them. Yes. Yeah. That's, they that's good to hear that. Know, Thank you. They need to know not to adopt Rhodes policies that just come so from MSBA. Yeah. Sorry, that's not our argument. Yeah. And to question when those policies don't seem right. So, yeah. So, no, there are some school board members who are yeah. listening. And, and we have we've had yeah. some great meetings. Um, we have had one-on-ones um, -on with a lot of board members, um, been able to lay out our concerns, lay out um, the issues. 
and they are, they're listening to us, you know, they're taking it back into consideration. You know, obviously when you're in those one-on-ones, they're not gonna be like, oh yeah, I agree or disagree, you know, um, but they're at least open to listening. We um, had a tentative meeting scheduled with multiple parties. We've met with the teachers union to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So um, we're trying to just, cause we want to hear like what the issues are, but like what you said, we go back to the fact that <coughs> it's a one party consent state. Um, I know the um, IDEA is silent on the issue and a memorandum has come out saying that, you know, yes, it can be up to the school district, but it cannot override state law. And the state mm. law is, um, and we, we have a, um, one of our members is an attorney and she's kind of leading the charge. Good. And, um, she is you know, ready to, to move on. So we're just kind of, we, we really feel that we can, I feel that confident that if everyone sits down and we should be able to hash this out and do the right thing. But if not, we're, we're ready to take the next step. Good. Because it is disturbing that the superintendent is saying it's a further issue, <laughs> which is totally wrong. You know, that's, he said on the radio you know, today. Uh, yeah, you on the radio, you know, that sounds convincing, but it's not. Um, so, like a HIPAA violation. I know, I know this is important because the family that we have been advocating for, Lynn actually started going to the meetings and taking minutes because mm -hmm. it was hard That's for important. the advocates to take minutes mm -hmm. and pay attention at the same time. So mm -hmm. Lynn was actually going and taking minutes and that's all she was doing was taking minutes. And, uh, and then we started recording and then we would go to a transcription service and we would upload it. So we were actually able to go back through and parse for ourselves. We weren't, we weren't blasting those meetings out because that is a privacy thing. So we weren't sharing those minutes with them. Those were just for us internally as advocates. But what was a similar strategy, they weren't mm -hmm. saying FERPA, but the social services people would say to the people who were defending, who were advocating for, well, you know, it's against your privacy to have those people. Don't you want this person to leave the room? And the people who were advocating for it, no. And they're like, are you sure? I mean, really, we really should have them leave. It really is against your interest. And they're like, no, it's our interest. We asked them, like, we went back and forth. <laughs> for minutes, and we finally had a lawyer say, I've never had advocates be asked to leave. So it was really interesting situation to be in. They that, can't do that to us because by federal law, we can invite your mom, your grandma, the oh, mayor. We can and they can write the same situation. They have the same situation. The same situation. But they pushed hard. The clients had to keep saying, no, it's my right, and I'm choosing this. And they had to say it like five times. Mm -hmm. But they could put it yeah. down to say, yeah. And so we will pick up. We will pick up on that. Is there anything else, Amy? What about you? What, what what's a hot? What's a what's a thing that we can add to our agenda when we go to our meeting? I don't know, but I've made a list for you. I have. I spoke to someone today who's really concerned about over discipline and uh, the police um, treating minors as adults and not understanding sort of the trickle down, right? Like what that begets. So if you look at the situation with the girl who was uh, wrongly arrested in January, all these months she's just had problem after problem after problem that spawned from that one incident. And the other thing is, and she was talking about trauma induced, you know, kids have these traumas. It could be that they have a trauma because their parents got a divorce. It could be a trauma that they were humiliated in class, you know, and these traumas stick with them. So if their if they're educators in the school is not aware of how school is traumatizing, I, I was quoting today in, in, the, in the documentary, Precious Knowledge, uh, this guy's arguing that the kids just don't care and they're lazy. And the guy said, you know what? I've never met a kid who has a dysfunctional relationship to learning. I've met a lot of kids who have a dysfunctional relationship with schools. And so our kids are having dysfunctional relationship with school in a way they don't want to go to school, they're attempting suicide, they're being ostracized, they're being bullied, and you know, it goes back to, well, their parents didn't do this, but, but what are you doing at school, right? Yeah, they're at school. Um, what, what are you doing to keep kids safe? So you asked that? Amy. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, tell me your things, Amy. I mean, I, I personally think it boils down to, you know, how do you, how do you get to know the student, yes. you know, on a different level? Relationships. Mm -hmm. And, and how do you engage that student? If, if a student, you know, if they're having a, an extra hard time in class, you need to figure out why. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not always as clear cut as a, a 
and it's what you see. No, that's why I said that you know, the red, the green, and the blue is not going to work. If, you, if you're not building a relationship with a kid and you make an assumption, well, I'll always do the red. I mean, you're, they could be a uh, uh, rainbow color, you know what I'm saying, which is in, <laughs> isn't in the list. Do you know what I'm saying? So you're right. The relationship thing is the most important thing. You're trying to fit, you know, um, maybe a round peg into a square hole, and and that is not always, you know, uh, beneficial for the child, or you know, and, and it may be the environment. It, it could be, you know, that that they don't learn that way, or they don't understand the the instructions, you know. But I think um, sometimes there is a lack of compassion and a lack Ooh. of listening, mm -hmm. and. Um, Wow. And when when you're told that you don't have time to to do that because you just don't have the resources, you know, that becomes a real issue. Wow. Um, you know, I could sit here and tell you horror story after horror story, but I won't. This year was exceptionally good for my son. Well, that's good. I'm glad. Unfortunately, the teacher um, is going to be moved to a different school oh, wow. now. So I'm, I'm hoping whoever they hire um, won't be like last year's teacher. So that's a, that raises another issue that came up in a conversation I was having today. Apparently, I don't know if it was an assistant principal or whatnot, Ed Smith did last year was moved to a different school. It was moved to Oakland, I think. So they shuffle teachers around as hotspots, teachers and administrators, mm -hmm. hotspot-wise. But in doing so, they've then removed the relationships yeah. that have been right. built. Mm -hmm. And somebody else has to come in and rebuild, um, or not build, depending on who they are. right? And so instead of shuffling and playing this game of shuffleboard with, with outstanding staff, hire more. Right, and figure it out um, so that you're not breaking relationships that have been established um, really for no reason. They do this in the social services thing too, like in the foster care system, they'll move kids who have been in one foster home oh, we've for had too long, long we've right? Had four, <laughs> we've had four social workers. <laughs> well, no, they'll even move since, kids from foster homes so they don't get too attached. I mean, so they're like breeding in yeah, the natural Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was going to say that one. Um, but it's the same idea that you don't you don't want to maintain yeah, you don't want to attach to the foster parents so that you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So, so probably what they need the most. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, this, yeah. so I don't want to go throughout the conversation, but that that relationship piece and the ways in which organizational dysfunction mm -hmm. or just poor design, organizational, organizational dysfunction, you know, drives mm -hmm. issues and behavioral issues. So would, we would describe as behavioral yeah. issues. Yeah. Well, so. Michelle. I think another thing too is um, parent education, not just so, yes, there are the procedures on that side, but let's teach the parents, okay, when this happens, mm -hmm. ask this question, this question, this yes. question. And I think the more you can educate um, the parents or even the students, you know, this to ask those questions, then some of that will kind of be and it needs to go on to the, the other way. It needs to go to the parent, not to where parents are, not. Oh, you can come here and we'll tell you about all of your rights oh, yeah, in jargon laden yeah. language. It'll be, I'm going to have a PhD and I'm sitting in an IEP meeting going. Exactly. Well, you, that's something we could collaborate on that we could have yes. workshops on yes. Yes. how yes. to insert yourself, yes. how to intervene. Right? That every meeting for SEPTA has an education component, like an hour, and it would be really cool to do one with you guys to where we like. Yeah, COVID do a travel or something. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot of need for that. What well, you said, Tara, you do a travel one. Traveling one. one that the, goes we around go to different schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. something yeah. the district and everybody should do. They should get out of their houses. That goes for the citizens' police review board, um, the school board members. They always everyone expects you to come to them, right? They should go to all these churches in town, make visits, and the recreation centers. I mean, just make go to the library, make take advantage of these things. Um, and yeah, I wanted to tell you today when I was when I was thinking with my pictures, I said we need alternate ways of generating new solutions through listening first before we can make meaningful, authentic restoration. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about you know this challenge that we have to not only listen, but this is how we build um, relationships with students. And 
We ta I talk to students, uh, uh, pre-service teachers about this a lot, that you're going to meet all kinds of kids come from all different walks of life. So our big challenge is just to disrupt this notion that everyone's life is the same as what mine has been. And if you're a very privileged person, cisgender, able-bodied, you have not had the experience of knowing what it's like to be another identity. So that is a huge journey for um, students that come through our, our College of Education. Right? They don't have a lot of experience with people that are different than them. They don't have a lot of experience. Now, what I do see is my, my SPED students are really have had some kind of life ex experience. They are really cued in to working with students with disabilities. But, but the other students who are not, um, they are, they're going to come into contact. And they're going to have students that have, but they have needs that are you know, well beyond their, their comfort zone. Right? Mm -hmm. So really what we're trying to teach our institutions how to move beyond their comfort zones. They have habit and they have hierarchies that allow them to you know, maintain their, you know, uh, this is the way we've always done it and we're going to keep doing it that way. And if you press us, we're going to start talking about how great we are and all the wonderful things we've done. <laughs> Seriously, they're like a broken record with it. Even right? my cookies. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that that's really important. Um, I also think a lot of parents get beat down and they feel like um, I'm not a good parent um, and I don't I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And we we have to um, really support them and give them positive um, vibes. And also, it's be honest, it's very uncomfortable to be the person that goes to the school board meeting and says, oh, by the way, I, I disagree with you. Like, you know, thank you, Chad, for going there and landing on them. You know, for a lot of people, that's a very uncomfortable place to be. And so we need to let people know that it's okay to challenge this, and that's our job as citizens, right? We're, we're not just in for the, you know, the, the, for the cookie session, right? So I think that's important. But I do have your notes about the recording that you that you do have some support. And Amy, I have your note about relationship building and the lack of um, compassion and listening. I will send you all this article that I saw today. Um, I'll post it now on, on Race Matters. It was on uh, uh, schools and, and trauma. And I, I think it's something that deserves um, a lot of attention. So um, Tracy, quickly. So what kind of, what kind of support do you you mentioned support what what did they say exactly support for from the, the policy yeah or support from the school board to to include or change the policy or what did they the offer what, what, what did they're they... doing right now is they moved they moved to take it out of the policy committee and put it in front of the entire board now mm. so at the June meeting. They, they put it in front of the board, but the only change that they've agreed to right now is that they're, or that they're trying to get through is to allow for if somebody has an ADA requirement. So it's not going far enough. Like if a mm -hmm. parent has a disability. Yes, if a parent. Which, yeah. You shouldn't, be able to you shouldn't have anyway. to yeah. say yeah. that I have a disability. What are so, those students? Yeah. Wow, they're well, really, they're really so really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And they want it's so they're, interesting. Yeah. So, so, so where? Are, so now it's June is going to be in front of the board, the full board, and that's where um, we've been having all these meetings because we're, the full board will be able to weigh in. And so, where what do you see would be the next steps that you, maybe we can partner with RMF? Next steps um, is basically letting people hear because they're hearing that the more people that they hear from that say yes, we need this change, we need to support. Um, as opposed to hearing, oh, we, we're scared it's going to create an adversarial relationship, um, which I, you know, I have a good relationship with my case manager, and I don't think that would change. I think if there's an adversarial relationship, it was already there. Mm -hmm. So then having a recording is actually probably going to help it because people will be on better behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the next step is really just kind of getting the voice to the school board about the change, and then um, it, it has to be first read in June, and then at the August or September, I'm unclear on which meeting is when we'll actually vote. So in between there, we just have to, we're just keep, we'll keep being our fingers in there and having meetings and trying to um, lay out. Well, and, and the other thing possibly, I think you all been in at the radio twice already? Yes. Last mm -hmm. week and then once before. Yes. It's just countering that message, right? Because if the superintendent this morning was saying, 
to the public, whoever was listening, including his school board, that it's FERPA, and it's then and then they're getting mixed, you know, mixed I'm, information on purpose. Or, yeah, we're pretty confident he knows it's not FERPA, right? Like you can't talk about another student in that meeting, like it's your kid. Yeah. So you're not allowed to. If you bring up someone, they can't even acknowledge that that person's in their class or anything. Mm -hmm. So I think it it would be important to maybe send us stuff or post stuff on yeah. our map. Yeah, um, and ask us to write letters to the board, whatever. Yes. Whatever. You so we should send. think about that kind of campaign. Amy, your longer campaign is the same cam same campaign that Tara cares about, yes. and that I care about is that treat my treat my child like a human being, right? Have a relation, have a relationship with them, get to know what their needs are. And I think SPED folks have the same uh, concern, but there's a weird thing going on that some of our students are really, really treated differently. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's much different than what's going on with policing. And uh, it's, it's an implicit bias. Now you bring it up, they get upset, oh, you're calling me racist, you're calling me sexist, or you're saying, I'm, you know, whatever. And, and, and the truth is, is that, I'm sorry, white people need to do a lot of, <laughs> so you of say, work on, on implicit bias. Right? You, so you say implicit bias, but at the same time, there's these laws that are, are, are willing to easily criminalize, mm -hmm. right? And so, sure, I, I understand there's the in intersection, but then there's this notion that whether you're an educator or you're a police officer, which you're supposed to be defending the good of and educating, but you have this law that's saying if you do something a misdeed, then let's criminalize you. Mm -hmm. So that's the other issue too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. that age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. those ages, like, like you were saying, well, clean it up. You know? Well, and you were looking at the numbers and there's an overrepresentation of African Americans instead by the population. So, and we know forever. This. Forever. Yes. Sure. Um, and so that, you know, we have questions about that kind of stuff because we've heard from parents um, elsewhere. That, that you were at the Worley Street Ground Table who were not happy that their kids were in SPED because they're like, my kid is not a SPED kid. It's not. It wasn't anything, you know, biased against it. It was just inappropriate. So there are and talk about setting up the school to prison pipeline yeah. there. So there, there is um, another thing that goes on, and that is that um, it's class. And so you have educators, you have a certain mindset um, of behaving and being and talking that fits their, their lived experience. And so when someone doesn't communicate in the way that they think is appropriate, um, they push back on it. And so, you know, you can have kids that are more loud and more loquacious and whatever. Um, even kids that talk back, teenagers <coughs> talk back. Mm -hmm. My middle son had the talk back disease bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it's what they do. They're teenagers, you know? And and so we're criminalizing kids for being for being rebellious and doing very normal teenage behavior. Now, running up in shoot schools and shooting schools up, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, we're talking about impulsive um, behavior, um, doing stupid stuff that we all probably did something in the realm of that when we were teenagers, and if we didn't get caught, we were lucky, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I am concerned overall um, about the inability to build relationships with students and to criminalize or marginalize them because they, the students come from a different cultural, um, racial, or ethnic, or a way of being, uh, you know, in terms of how they dress, that makes them um, unacceptable mm -hmm. to an educator. And if it's not to the educator, not intervening when kids are bullying other kids is also hugely problematic. And the only people, the only person that can fix that is yeah. the principal at that school, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to wrap up because otherwise Lynn will get me because it's eight o'clock. <laughs> thank you so up. much, everyone. We thank everybody thank for coming. For having us. And we'll, we you will be, coming, yeah. um, you put your emails in my book, right? So yeah, I have yes. a way, and David knows how to reach you too. And we can keep these, right? And you well, and yeah, I are Facebook friends. friends. Are you and I yeah. Facebook students? Okay, so you guys can you guys can keep Amy. Are you my Facebook friend? Oh, I don't You should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, just so that we can share, David shared an article on restorative practices, and which is a little bit critical of restorative practices. So I, the one you shared, I think, in terms of the their the the, in terms of its efficiency, and so anyway, we we need to have a, a larger conversation about. 
what we think those restorative practices should look like and, and what they're doing. And I think it'd be great to, to keep an eye on sped and overlapping with that, yes. that intersectionality. Because, yes. Um, yeah, we have issues with our kids that overlap a lot. Right. Yeah. Right, and I think we have to keep looking at that overlap and intersection. It's not just this one thing. It's multiple things happening at the same time. And how do we get people on board without them getting all bent out of shape? Because we're like, hey, well, we, we want more, right? So if you want to invite us to your meeting next time, and then uh, whatever any action items, our action items are taught to, meeting with Carla London, and uh, the principal is Mitten. Uh, he's invited us to. And then me, them. I'm going to meet with um, um, Jeff Jones and uh, Teresa Solis Metz, who's our bridge director. So the bridge at the College of Ed is really cool because they have all this different program to give students the opportunity to have larger conversations on big issues. So students get practice discussing mm -hmm. tough issues. So I'd like to see like the police and other people in the community attend mm -hmm. those meetings. But maybe we need something like that in our our community that's bigger, right? I mean, we can't all fit in the bridge, but we don't really have anybody forging that between the police and the school district. You know, we don't have that kind of collaborative conversation going on so that we can put all these kind of issues on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, my phone data is about to be <laughs> All right, good night. Thank you guys. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.